Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 2012 Weber Days History Lecture here at the Iowa City Public Library and for those joining us from home on Library Channel 10. Hi, those at home. I've borrowed this introduction about Irving B. Weber from the wonderful biography that Lolly Eggers, who is in our audience, wrote for her biography of Irving Weber. Irving Weber lived his entire life from 1900 to 1997, almost the entire 20th century in Iowa City. The University of Iowa's first all-American swimmer, longtime businessman, popular community leader, and founder of the Quality Check Dairy Association, Weber wrote over 850 newspaper articles on local history after his 72nd birthday, and in 1989 earned the Iowa City, the title Iowa City's Official Historian. To honor Irving Weber's legacy to Iowa City and Johnson County, institutions and organizations created the annual Irving B. Weber Days. Irving B. Weber Elementary School and the 2003 bronze statue at Lynn and Iowa Avenue are some of the other ways the community remembers a beloved citizen. For more information on other Weber Days activities, please visit the Iowa City Public Library or the Johnson County Historical Society's websites. There are lots and lots of activities. And I brought with me just a little plug here, Abraham Lincoln, because a number of the activities for this year's Irving B. Weber Days have to do with the Civil War, including a, a Civil War tour that will be on Sunday the 20th, and it will be buildings that were extant during the Civil War, and so that limits them right there, so quite a while ago. So that will be start at the Old Capitol and include the First Congregational Church and Old Brick. And one of the interesting things that we're doing in the the Congregational Church is we're having a pop-up museum. So any of you out there at home or in the audience who have things from the Civil War time period and you'd like to learn more about them or share what you have with the community, the pop-up museum will be from 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock on the 20th. And the day before, we'll have some more University of Iowa people, including one of the people in the room, talking about Civil War items at the University of Iowa, including their fascinating collection of Civil War diaries and letters and how they are crowdsourcing that collection to get them transcribed and so they can share more with the public. So today's speak speech is from the University of Iowa, and the University of Iowa Libraries has been at the forefront of preserving and sharing Irving Weber's unique take on local history. Today we are fortunate to have Matt Butler, former Iowa City Public Library employee, Jen Wolf, and Mark Anderson from the University of Iowa's Library's Digital History and Publishing Department. Their presentation, Exploring Local History Through Digital Collections, will talk about digital resources for exploring local history, including, including user-generated data. If you don't know what that means, you're going to learn. Maps and Irving Weber databases to answer specific local history questions. So I'll call our three speakers up to the podium, and then there'll be time for questions either during the presentation or after, after the presentation. And in honor of Irving Weber's long legacy of quality checked, we do have ice cream from Whitey's here, so help yourself. They're over there on the counter. And whoever's first, come on up. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody, and thanks for coming. Um, as Maeve mentioned, I work for the UA Library's Digital Research and Publishing Department, which is responsible for maintaining the Iowa Digital Library. So today, oh, I am going to be giving a general overview of the IDL and its local history collections, and then my colleagues and I will tell you a little about some specific initiatives we're working on. Um, the Iowa Digital Library is a freely accessible online repository with over half a million digitized objects from the holdings of the University of Iowa and its community partners. Um, these objects cover a wide range of formats, including scrapbooks, photographs, artworks, maps, audio, video, and more. Uh, selecting this uh, Campus in Iowa History heading on the IDL homepage will pull up a subset of local history materials. And these include the Daily Iowan Historic Newspapers, um, the Iowa Children's Diaries, Hawkeye Yearbooks, Iowa City Flood Photos, and uh, additional materials. My job is to help coordinate access to these digital objects to make them easier to find and use. And um, in contrast, I'm, I'm sure I'm the only one who does this, uh, at home I have a folder on my hard drive where I dump all my digital photos of my family or whatever and I always think I'm going to organize them but I don't and all the file names are just a mysterious string of letters and numbers assigned by my camera. Do you know what I'm talking about? 
Thank you. <laughs> um, so the only way I can ever find anything is to browse the thumbnails, and the more photos I add, the harder it is to find anything. Um, but at work, I'm a lot more conscientious, and I help make the library's assets more findable by creating metadata. Um, which is just a fancy term for this type of searchable, structured information that you're used to looking at in an online library catalog. With types of text uh, collections, such as the Irving Weber books, we enhance the metadata further <coughs> through an automated process called the Optical Character Recognition, or OCR scanning. So that takes um, the image of the book page, which is basically just a digital photograph, and runs it through software that creates a fully searchable text file. So every word in the digitized Weber books becomes an access point. Uh, so when I search on the term public library, I receive this set of results. And when I click down to the page level, here are my search words uh, highlighted off to the side there. Oh. Uh, uh, OCR scanning has provided an unprecedented, unprecedented level of access to printed information, particularly with sites like Google Books, and it's having a transformative effect on the way people do research. Uh, however, with non-typeset collections, providing comparable access <coughs> is a lot more challenging. For image collections like the Iowa City Town and Campus scenes with, with its 11,000 photographs from the early to mid 20th century, <coughs> Or the Civil War Diaries and Letters, which is, which is, uh, with its 20,000 pages of handwritten documents, the volume of materials means that the library doesn't have the resources to provide much more than very basic information, making the digital collection a lot less useful than it could be. Um, this is something that a lot of libraries have been struggling with, and thanks to the development of social media technologies, we've been able to engage directly with our users and let them help us add value to the digital collections through a process called crowdsourcing. Oh, a quick definition, crowdsourcing is the act of outsourcing tasks to an undefined group of people or community, and it's become shorthand for the trend of leveraging mass collaboration enabled by Web 2.0 technologies to achieve business goals. Um, this probably seems lazy to point you towards Wikipedia, uh, and it is, but Wikipedia itself is actually a very successful example of the ph phenomenon. Uh, oh, thank you. Um, since it's a massive crowdsourced document created and maintained by millions of volunteer users. So one way we've been employing crowdsourcing for our digital collections is to upload some of our historic photographs to Flickr. Um, and uh, this is an item from the Iowa City Town and Campus Scenes collection, and this is what it looks like in the Iowa Digital Library. Uh, as I mentioned, this is one of 11,000 photos, so we have to keep our metadata to a pretty bare minimum. We just identify the image as Calvin Hall here on campus. Um, we include the date and a few subject headings. Uh, and this is what happened when uh, we put the same photo in Flickr. An extremely helpful Flickr user left this comment supplying historical context about the building. Uh, well, you can see that. Um, he described its former location on the Pentagrest and the process of moving it across the street, and then he cites his source for people who want to read more. Um, plus, he added his own personal memory of the building at the bottom, uh, and at the library, we would never have the resources to go into such detail, but thanks to our users, we're able to migrate this information from Flickr back to the digital library, um, greatly adding value to the content. Our other crowdsourcing initiative involves inviting our users to transcribe handwritten materials. Um, so for our Civil War diaries, which I, I mentioned include over 20,000 pages of handwritten text, we're only able to catalog at the broadest level. Um, so this is a set of several hundred pages of correspondence and journal entries written by a Civil War soldier named Oliver Boardman. Um, since this material is handwritten rather than typeset, we can't do automated scanning to provide the type of page level full text searching I showed you with the Weber collection. And um, at the library, we don't have the resources to transcribe each page ourselves. Uh, so we outsourced it to our users who can access the content through this site. Um, they select a page and then type the handwritten entries into the transcription box here. Uh, we migrate the data back to the digital library and it comes uh, fully searchable. So here's a result for on a search for Iowa City. Uh, I don't know how well you can see that. The, um, the letter itself is almost impossible to see, so it's extremely impressive that someone was able to, to transcribe this. Um, 
but it's uh, dated 1862 in Camp Pope. Um, the soldier is writing to uh, Ellen, a family member. Um, he's located in Iowa City, so that's a lot of fun to just sort of see what was going on uh, locally during the Civil War. Um, so that is all oh, I have for you now. Is these are just some URLs if you want to explore the digital library and um, help us with our crowdsourcing. Thank you. Okay, did everybody get time to copy down the URLs? Um, I'm Mark Anderson from uh, Digital Research and Publishing at the University of Iowa Libraries, and I'm going to talk to you uh, about maps because I work somewhat with uh, map resources and digitizing maps. And <clears throat> when I was uh, trying to figure out what I was going to talk about uh, regarding maps, I uh, started um, I started poking around the uh, Irving Weber collection, which is. Jen pointed out is um, in the campus and Iowa history um, uh, category of the, the Iowa Digital Library uh, down here. And I just uh, searched the word map and came up with uh, this article, uh, which uh, is uh, an article about uh, the Rundell edition uh, to Iowa City, just here to the east. Um, it also happens to be the 300th article that Irving Weber wrote for the Iowa City Press Citizen. Um, and uh, what it's showing, it's a neat map um, done by a University of Iowa professor in 1908 um, showing how the, uh, the Rundell farm would be uh, platted. And um, it shows how uh, Ralston Creek and the uh, streetcar line had to be moved um, so that they didn't uh, meander all over people's lots uh, that they were trying to sell. And um, when, I, when I first looked at this, um, I kind of had a hard time getting my bearings. And then I realized that uh, north is uh, pointing left. So then you know, turn your head, and then you can see, uh, see that a little, little easier. Um, and then uh, it gave me an opportunity to uh, use a tool uh, on the web that uh, allows you to place uh, a historic map over the top of a current map. And it's something that I've uh, been wanting for several years, um, which is to uh, do that without any specialized software. Um, there are a lot of uh, mapping tools on the web, um, but one in particular that's been developed by uh, Harvard University um, came in handy this time. Um, so I'm going to pull that up. Uh, so uh, this is what I ended up with, and um, this tool, uh, World Map, um, allows you to pretty easily uh, take uh, a map that you've uh, saved, uh, a map image, and um, overlay it on top of a current map. And the way that it does that is um, it puts your map uh, that you upload side by side with a uh, current map, which in this case is Google and you put a point on both maps that you think is the same place. And after you've put in three or four points, it, um, what it calls warps the map to fit uh, the best um, on the current map. As you can see, it's kind of, it's twisted a little bit, um, but the, the, um, the best results come from um, how accurate uh, the uh, historic map is. And in this case, uh, it's, it's pretty good. So you can see uh, where this map is uh, that Irving Weber included in the article. Um, and you can do uh, some nice things then in this interface like um, toggle between um, the uh, satellite view and, and a map view. And then with the uh, historic map, you can change the uh, transparency to uh, confirm that uh, actually Ralston Creek is in the same place they put it 100 years ago. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if anybody uh, out there lives in this neighborhood, um, but you can see um, 
how disruptive it would be uh, to have the streetcar um, uh, going through your house or backyard. Um, so what they did was they, uh, they moved Ralston Creek uh, to the alley between Grant and Rundell Street, and the streetcar um, from its diagonal jogs uh, to right down the middle of Rundell Street down to the uh, streetcar maintenance facility. And, uh, and in this interface, um, once you have your, your map um, warped and referenced on top of, of the current map in uh, World Maps system, um, you can do things like add additional points uh, and, and link them to content. So I did that up here with, um, with uh, the photographs that were in the, the article. So, uh, so here's the, the photograph from the article of the Rundell House uh, at the corner of uh, Court and Oakland. Um, and then also uh, down here, uh, this is Kelly Manufacturing, uh, which was um, at the south end of Grant Street. And uh, the streetcar photograph, uh, which I don't know if this was actually taken in this location, but, uh, but you can put it down there. They, they used this streetcar uh, to give people free rides to the, to the lots that they were trying to sell to try and uh, drum up business. Um, Irving Weber's article goes on to talk about um, a lot of the interesting kinds of um, publicity they did to sell these lots. Um, they built a baseball diamond um, uh, just to the side of the addition and invited semi-pro baseball teams to, uh, to play games and have people come out. And they had a, um, a young woman go up in a hot air balloon and parachute down. Um, I guess she ended up uh, over at St. Mary's Church or something. And um, <laughs> unfortunately, a month later, she, uh, she died in a, a parachuting accident. So. Um, so there's a lot of interesting history um, related to this, um, this Rundell edition and being able to picture uh, this map um, in, in terms of, of what's there today um, really helps uh, in putting it in perspective um, in addition to having it in the orientation that, that we're all used to. Uh, so, um, Tools like these continue to come about on the web. Uh, uh, it, it took me about half a day to get this map into this interface. It's not uh, totally intuitive, but, uh, but it's getting better. And, uh, and these tools are um, starting to um, make th this kind of thing that we've been wanting to do for years a lot more accessible. Uh, so. Um, so that's all that I have to say about that, and I'll turn it over to Matt. Hello. So uh, I don't have a PowerPoint, but I'm just going to show you a bunch of things that I have in a folder here. Part of my job is uh, offering technical support to these tools and researching emerging technology and looking at where the future might be headed. And so uh, that's a little bit of what I want to do today. Um, let's get a picture of Irving going here. That's Irving Weber. Uh, and if you've ever read Irving, uh, you know that a favorite narrative device of his is to take readers on a fantasy tour into the past of old Iowa City. And he combined personal experience with uh, his own research to paint a interesting historical picture of the town before living memory. So I thought it might be interesting to do the same, but projecting us into the near future, to the bicentennial of Iowa City. And perhaps by looking at the emerging digital tools, we can learn more about the current digital tools that we're using and best ways to preserve local history for generations to come. So, um, we're going, I, this is based on a, an article that he wrote which is right here, I'll bring this one up again, called A Scenic Afternoon Ride in Iowa City of 1895. But I'm gonna do A Scenic Afternoon Ride of Iowa City 2039. 
So it's a, win a sunny Wednesday afternoon and we're looking to commemorate the bicentennial of our fair city with a historic driving tour in the spirit of Irving Weber, who conducted many such tours throughout the 20th century. We've scanned through all the local archives in just under 10 seconds and have compiled a list of suitable routes. Let's take a look at suitable routes here. Here's uh, a list of suitable routes in Iowa City. Um, and any of these routes might work, but we've decided on a fictional 1895 tour as described by Mr. Irving Weber in an article published in the Iowa City Press Citizen on February 13th, 1980, compiled by the Lions Club in book form in 1987, and archived by the University of Iowa Digital Library on December 1st, 2006. This is article 293, page 51, and I've got a little copy. We can also bring this up here. Um, Got a list of links. That's Conan O'Brien in the year 2000. <laughs> Sorry, we're doing this in real time. In the future, this will be really fast. So it's uh, from this book, which Jen also had in her slide. Um, so. We've taken this article and in our computer, which is invisible to the naked eye, it automatically does a text analysis of all the location points in the text itself. And it has uh, cross-referenced those with archives and it's detected all the place names and it geo-references them and locates them on a map. And then it generates a route. And this is all done. We can all do this ourselves right now, but this will all happen automatically. And this, uh, then it is piped into our uh, car, our self-driving car here, which Google just received. <laughs> this is me in the year 2039, driving around in a self-driving car. Google just received a patent for a self-driving car this week um, in Nevada. So this is all this technology I'm talking about is being developed right now and is on the horizon. So we're driving around. This is all pumped, piped directly into our self-driving car. And uh, we spend the afternoon leisurely winding through Iowa City with our hologram Irving Weber in our dash. And the city comes alive on our windshield display as real-time data, data and archival material augments our real view. And the holographic Irving narrates part of our trip. I'll just leave him up here. And as we turn right onto College Street, uh, here's an old map from 1920. Uh, we pass the Lindsay House, which is also known as the Gingerbread House, which is also known as the Bloom County House depending on which point in history you're looking at uh, uh, the archives. And we make our way to Burlington Street. This was a famous uh, and a very popular route of Irving's. Um, he liked to take us down that, that way. We pass Burlington and approach an intersection of Court Street and Summit. I think I've got Court and Summit here somewhere. There's Court and Summit. You're familiar with where that's at. And you might know what is located at Court and Summit if you're familiar with Iowa City. And we reach this intersection. And at a, the set of coordinates from our GPS, coupled with the image detection algorithms in our onboard camera, uh, we detect an old weather-beaten stone marker, uh, which I have pictures of right here. You know what this is. This is the uh, original. Uh, marker marking the southeast corner of the first plat of Iowa City. Hologram Irving uh, tells us that it's known as the old limestone shaft or the obelisk or the established rock corner or a monument of stone or the limestone spire depending on where we're looking it up from. And a couple of archival films begin to play on our windshield display. One of them is uh, a bus tour from October 3rd, 1992. You may have seen this. This is pulled from the Iowa City collection, video collection. And 
Holographic Irving is able to assemble all of these in real time, looking in the databases and putting them together based on the, the data that is the wonderful metadata provided by librarians everywhere. And we see this. for the uh, Iowa City southeast corner when they laid out the city in, in uh, 1839. So they put that stone there, that marks the southeast corner. Okay, now we're out of the original square mile for about a block. Then we're going to turn right and we'll set heading for home. So Holographic Irving pulls up an old photo video of himself uh, giving a tour. Uh, the second is from a digitized slideshow of F.W. Kent photos, also from the Iowa City Streaming Collection. And we get to see this. It's part of the Bicentennial Project. The Cornerstone Monument on Summit Street, erected in 1839, where Summit Street intersects the line of East Court Street. The stone marks the southeast corner of section number 10, chosen by the surveyors, Swan, Ronalds, and Ralston, on commission from the territorial government of Burlington as a site for the capital city for the Iowa Territory. So we've learned a little bit about this stone marker. We know that it was the original um, marker that those gentlemen, as mentioned in the, the archival film, uh, described. But a uh, hologram Irving takes our current coordinates from our GPS and instantly translates them into the coordinate description system from 1839, which is a little bit different. And it's also found on the bronze plaque attached to the marker. And it says, section number 10, township 79, NR, 6W of the fifth prime meridian. meridian. And so scanning through uh, various databases, he, or holographic Irving, finds that that was mentioned in a book called The Old Stone Capital, a digitized copy of which does not yet exist, but probably will in the future at some point. Um, and uh, Irving, he scans the coordinates and uh, uses this textural data to form a bit of trivia for us. He tells us that the original inscription in the marker was carved into the stone but began to fade away due to the elements. And uh, this book by Benjamin F. Shambaugh, of course, you're familiar with that name if you've lived in Iowa City. Uh, Shambaugh himself was the one to transcribe the faded, uh, trans the faded inscription on the stone in 1893 for his book, which is also will be digitized in the future, which is called... Iowa City, a contribution to the early history of Iowa. All of this text is easily searchable, will be easily searchable at some point, and Holographic Irving takes this and compiles these into bits of trivia as we ask them. So we're able to converse with him in real time, ask things, and he responds with the relevant data. And so, he, so Shambaugh, Irving tells us, transcribed this in 1893, which then made it onto the plaque, which I have a picture of right here. So that's the, the bronze plaque that's currently on there, and um, he's got a full transcription in his book, which we can search through. Um, and this was marked by the Pilgrim chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution in 1935. So he's... It, Irving is able to jump us around from 1839 to 1893 to 1935 fairly effortlessly. And he also, in his wit, jokes with us in holographic form that in 1935, a typo was introduced to the bronze plaque. You'll notice that it's spelled the Capitol with an O of Iowa City. And he muses that this is perhaps due to the fact that the old capital building itself was built, was quite a popular landmark by 1935, and that the original stone inscription was spelled with an A as transcribed by Shambaugh in 1893. And so we keep driving on and we ask Irving if this was the original location of the stone marker or not, or if it had ever been moved. 
So he takes us, he pulls up various plat maps from the Johnson County Assessors and Recorder's Office and takes us through all of these databases. And we've got, he doesn't use Adobe Reader, but <laughs> he's got access to this map right here, uh, which is turned and I can give you a little better view here. So this is frozen. There we go. Right here is where we are. That's the extreme southeast corner of the original mile um, plat. These, these were all, this was where they laid the first stone. The stone was actually laid, Irving tells us, the summer of 1839, and this was a wooden marker for a couple of months. And on this plat map, which has the coordinates as located um, on the stone itself, the established rock corner is the name given on this original map. So we ask him, Irving, has this ever been moved or is this in the same place? And he scans this, determines that it is, and also pulls up a newspaper clipping from November 1st, 2011, which was 28 years in the past. And called Mystery Solved. Now, he probably didn't pull this up from the PressCitizen.com website. Um, he probably accessed this from a library database of some sort. But from this information, he's able to pull out the relevant data and tell us that in the year 2011, a surveyor and engineer by the name of Glenn Meisner verified through his own research uh, with the plat maps going back through deeds and, and maps uh, over 172 years and through his own surveying that it was in fact the original location and that the stone marker we're looking at is has never moved. So we let Irving take a moment to tell us a little bit more about what the world was like. He's able to supplement our research as far as we're willing to, to go. We just ask him questions and he answers them. Uh, what was the world of 1839 like? And he describes this, this world of changing technology and changing social norms. Uh, the camera was a brand new invention in 1839 in France. Uh, the first commercial electric telegraph line was laid. Uh, vulcanized rubber was invented in this year. The first public university west of the Mississippi was formed around this time. And the concept of a public high school was a brand new invention, the third of such uh, opened this year. Um, women were just starting to finally be able to own property in 1839. The first woman in Mississippi, uh, first in the country, uh, owned property this year. And the horrors of slavery were still present, but this was also the year of the Amistad slave uprising. So it was a time of great change, and this probably would have definitely impacted the, um, at least informed the, the original founders of Iowa City. So we're happy with our results and we're on our way. And I just want to say that it's, um, it might seem a little bit far-fetched what I'm talking about, but like I said before, all of these things are currently in development. Um, maybe not by the Iowa Digital Library, but we are providing the tools necessary to uh, allow this data to be shared with the world for other people to, um, to archive and use in uh, various ways. And so in some ways, this is not so much a uh, fantasy, but more of a work plan for the next 27 years, which for myself personally, uh, bicentennial puts me right around um, retirement age. So <laughs> this is what I'm going to try and work towards until I retire. Um, and so that's, that's the, all the work that we have left to do in the Iowa Digital Library. Uh, thanks. So could you tell us some of the things, maybe not in the next 40 years, but in the next couple of years that you're looking at to add to the Iowa Digital Library? 
And what are you doing to identify things that are going on right now that are the kinds of things that you want to archive there? Hmm, who wants to answer that? <laughs> well, I can, I can start taking a shot at it. I mean, one, one of the most difficult things right now is that um, so we've dealt with a lot of digitizing um, paper physical artifacts um, that have already been archived by um, University of Iowa Special Collections and the library in general. Um, and now so much new content is already digital, um, but it's also in uh, kind of an ephemeral form um, with um, audio and video that's in constantly changing formats. Um, images tend to be a little more stable. Um, and so um, one of the initiatives uh, that's uh, going on at the university archives is to archive websites um, and uh, through a, a, a service that takes a snapshot of, of websites um, at predetermined points um, so that those materials won't just be lost when the websites are, are updated um, or, or changed. Um, so that's um, that's the Internet Archive and the Wayback Machine, if you're if you're familiar with that. Um, but in terms of um, the work that that our department uh, is actually doing, we we're we're moving um, somewhat towards, um, uh, or I should say, moving from um, just digitizing materials to adding value to those um, materials. So like what Jen talked about with the, the crowdsourcing um, and increasing access towards those materials and then uh, uh, combining materials. So you talk about um, mashups um, in terms of um, different resources um, coming together in one interface like maps and letters or um, photographs and and video so um, so that's some of the work that, um, uh, that we're doing right now I'll let you. Um, and I'll just mention uh, one of the current initiatives is uh, we're working with faculty on campus to um, as Mark said add value to the collections so instead of just putting up a digital archive um, we're trying to add scholarship that provides context um, to make items more useful that way. And um, uh, we're partnering with a new uh, initiative on campus. It's a digital studio for the public humanities. And um, in the past, the model of academic scholarship was, you know, the, the print monograph. So um, the faculty member, you know, creates this, this book that just gets put on a shelf and um, maybe not a whole lot of people read it. So now we're working with them to put the content online, um, make it pub publicly accessible, and you know, make it make it interesting for the general public. And um, it's just kind of a, a way to pay back the taxpayers in addition to um, learn about new forms of scholarship. What do you got? Uh, we have a three D box. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're gonna show a three D box. I don't know if we're allowed to show it. We're not. We're no one will know. Special. <laughs> It's only on TV. Yeah, this is for TV, <laughs> TV audience. I'll even show it. I don't Millions know. are watching. I, yeah. <laughs> I don't know how to get to it from content DM. Um, Digital.lib.uio.flexus. Let's hope it loads. Oh, not, not in Okay. So, lest you think this is all science fiction, uh, this is from <laughs> The special collections, this is a Fluxus object uh, from the 70, early 70s. So uh, we digitized this and made a 3D model out of it. And this uh, hopefully um, will supplement the collection for scholars in the future. What's on the top of that box? On the top is, this is a rough draft, by the way. So that you're getting a sneak preview. But uh, there's a slit, and uh, you stick your finger in the slit. And <laughs> If you're familiar with Fluxus art, they're very playful and uh, full of gags, and this is one of them. Um, so will you be able to do that eventually? That's the next iteration, yes. <laughs> and what is that? That's for Matt retires. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah, this is for the year 2039. You're going to design a virtual finger to... For, maybe. <laughs> At least this will... Um, 
this will be perhaps uh, the studios working on gestural computing, um, triggering events and manipulating objects in 3D space. And so perhaps someday we can link this up. They can take the data from this collection, which will also be provided in a standard format with the texture files and everything uh, that they can use to build interesting exhibits. And so um, the so possibilities could, are endless. You could recreate Irving Weber's Iowa City Physically. Yes. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, next step is holographic Irving. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Are you going to be um, f going out further geographically to get in materials from all over Iowa? Um, one, yeah, was, the, um, the Iowa Women's Archives. Um, at the University of Iowa. I don't know if you're familiar, but it's their 20th anniversary. Um, and um, they, and, and if I can pull, if, now if I can pull up this uh, URL, we've been working with them to develop a map um, that can show where all of their collections are from. Um, and let's see. Well, this should come up because it's in Chrome. Um, this will be worth it. Oh, you're right. I think this will be worth it. our PowerPoint that's kind of hogging all the, the resources. Um, this, so, uh, this is a map that shows all the iWomen's Archives collections all over the world. Um, and uh, you can click on a point to see um, what that collection is. Um, and um, this is another sneak preview. Uh, so we have a uh, map that's not quite ready for prime time. Um, I'm trying to zoom in so that we can just see Iowa here. Can you, can you find Iowa? <laughs> <laughs> um, and one of the reasons why the Women's Archives wanted to develop this map is to get a, a visual sense of where collections were, um, uh, what grouped and, and what areas of the state were represented or not represented. Um, and talked about the idea of uh, going to these um, empty spots on the map and, uh, and, and trying to gather collections um, from those areas. Uh, so. And this map actually links um, these dots link to the collection guide, which is just a description of the archival collection. Um, but we do have a site where you can see the digital content. Based on geographic area, I hope. Hmm. Or that's something I need to add when I get back to the office. So <laughs> <laughs> um, you can browse by topic and in format, and time period. Um, so uh, before Matt retires, and maybe before the end of the day, uh, <laughs> there will be a section for browsing uh, by. Geographic curry. Wow. One other project going much farther afield. Um, Matt and I have uh, worked uh, quite a bit on this project. The library has been uh, partnering. Jen was talking about faculty collaboration, um, uh, and uh, we're just putting the finishing touches on um, a, a DVD and also a, a site that. Um, that uh, is the work of a linguistics professor um, at University of Iowa, uh, Bill Davies. And these are stories from the island of Madura, 
which is um, an island um, off of Java in Indonesia. And, um, and he took video of, um, I don't know how loud this is going to be. <laughs> Once it comes up. So these are videos of a storyteller um, <coughs> and uh, with uh, subtitles in English and Indonesian and uh, the um, transcript below is in, in English Indonesian Majuris, uh which is uh, uh, the language of Madura and then also um, a linguistic um, analysis of, of the story. Um, and so, um, and so you can both follow along um, uh, with the story and also um, search, I assume, uh, let's see if the search is working on this one. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, so you can search for uh, t words in the story um, and, uh, and, and play the video and follow along. So there's the word story. So, uh, so again, it's um, adding value to, um, to these resources um, that go um, well beyond uh, Iowa. And, uh, and so our department um, is working with faculty in a lot of different areas um, uh, to enhance their research. Any other questions? Well, thank you all very much for coming. That was a fantastic presentation, and we're not going to wait for 27 years. We want it more quickly than that. Thank you very much. <laughs>